Thank you, Dean. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, and before I begin, let me also say that, like uh, Professor Farah before, uh, a lot of my presentation is going to be based on my own experience. Uh, before I came into academics, I practiced uh, primarily labor law in the United States. And in that field, I primarily did arbitration and mediation, and probably have been involved in hundreds uh, of arbitration proceedings in particular. So I, I have a sense from a participant point of view about some ethical and moral issues in arbitration. Um, what I wanted to raise uh, at the outset is some things I'm not going to concentrate a lot on, but I just wanted to at least uh, raise them as issues. Um, I'm going to be focusing on ethical and moral issues for arbitrators and mediators. Uh, there are also plenty of ethical and moral issues for attorneys involved in mediation and arbitration. And I just wanted to bring up a couple of these. And again, particularly international arbitration. Uh, one article in preparing this presentation called it the Wild West of Ethics, International Arbitration. Uh, and the example I have uh, you know, on the screen is, is it would have maybe been unrealistic 20 years ago, but now you could have a New York lawyer working in Tokyo at a British firm on an international arbitration case involving clients from Korea and Australia, and it's held in the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. And what ethics rules apply in those situations? And you know, in particularly, and Professor Ramirez spoke a little bit about it this morning in the context of the United States, particularly witness preparation rules are, are very different in, in all of these jurisdictions. And that creates some ethical dilemmas for international lawyers practicing in arbitration. Uh, another issue uh, of, for practitioners, at least from my perspective, has been the ethics of drafting unfair arbitration agreements between corporations and employees or consumers. Uh, in my field, many lawyers would want, uh, who are representing you know, large employers or corporations, uh, prefer to have employment disputes handled in arbitration. And in the United States, there's an obvious reason for that, is it takes you out of the jury trial. If you get into arbitration, it's just an arbitrator deciding it and not uh, a, a, a jury of your peers. Some arbitration agreements have been held by the courts to be unfair. Uh, and particularly if you have, for example, you, you give your employee a list of one arbitrator. This will be the arbitrator that's deciding your case. And it's someone who's paid for by the company. You know, that, that's inherently unfair. Or if you give them a list of arbitrators that's chosen by the company, that could also be unfair. The, question, the ethical question could be, for a, for a lawyer involved, do you do that? I mean, maybe the, how many employees are going to challenge that in court? They may just go along with it. And so that's, I think, an ethical issue it's a, or a moral issue even for a lawyer. Do you design this arbitration agreement that probably will not be upheld in court and may take away the rights of an employee that he or she otherwise might have had. It, it's an issue. And then finally, adding to the ethical problems, uh, particularly in international arbitration, the conduct of the parties may be unregulated. While, while we, you know, most societies have something like perjury, it's a crime to tell false testimony under oath, in certain arbitration proceedings, uh, that might not be the case. And so if the parties are unregulated, where, what position does that put the lawyer in? Those are just some issues to think about. I'm not going uh, to dwell on them. Let me first talk about ethical and moral issues or dilemmas for arbitrators. And the, the first point I want to make about that is, is a question for, uh, for, for the audience, in a sense, is should there be any ethical rules for arbitrators at all? And, and there is an argument that there should not be. Uh, that, that argument would be based on uh, you're in arbitration, what are you doing? You, you have a public court system. You have very good judges in your own legal systems. So by choosing to have a privatized form of justice, maybe you give up these judicial codes of ethics and all these ethical rules that might apply to your nation's judges. And instead, you've chosen to go out of the system. And will arbitrators from time to time be unethical? Yes, 
And what's the correction of it? Should we have a, a detailed ethical code and, and, and an honor court for arbitrators or some regulation? And, and some commentators think, no, the market corrects that. <laughs> if Shemansky is a terrible, unethical arbitrator, that information will get around, and, and will I get business in the future? Hopefully not. Uh, the market could correct that. And, and so some critics suggest that arbitrators should not have any kind of formalized ethical regulation at all. If you want that, stay in the national court system. Um, the other criticism about holding arbitrators to some type of ethical rules is that arbitrators are not judges. Uh, one of the reasons you may choose an arbitrator is they're not some isolated individual, I say a splendid isolation, on a hill but instead, they're part of the business and commercial community. And by virtue of that, they're going to have deeper and closer connections with businesses and industry than a judge would. And, and, and people who choose arbitration know that or should know that and, and accept that there could be some closer relationships between arbitrators and some businesses than judges and private uh, business society. Nevertheless, uh, the trend is to regulate arbitrators uh, with ethical codes. Uh, where, where is the source of these codes? From private ADR service <coughs> providers, the American Arbitration Association, uh, various international arbitration societies, ABA has model rules of ethics, uh, the International Bar Association also has some model rules. In a sense, this goes back to my earlier comment that you could say the market is providing this, right? Because if the Shemansky Arbitration Association, if I want to get business, if I have an ethical code, you might think my roster of arbitrators are more trustworthy. And so therefore, maybe that is a re reaction to the market rather than regulation. What are the common points of these codes? Integrity, fairness, uh, disclosure of conflicts is important. Uh, if the arbitrator, again, and typically arbitration, these people have been private attorneys, are still private attorneys, and you have to disclose any possible relationship, current or past, that could show that you might not be neutral in this situation. Uh, if we look at all these rules, disclosure is critical. Rules about communications with parties, uh, or ex parte uh, communication. Generally, arbitrators can communicate with parties independently, but only on logistical issues, uh, about scheduling matters, things like that, not about the substance of the case. About fair and just decisions, confidentiality. Again, that's another reason that people opt out of the public courts. They, they want this decision to be not known. And arbitrators do have a duty of confidentiality about their opinions. They have to get permission from the parties sometimes to even disclose the opinion. Uh, there's also various rules about fees and expenses uh, and advertising. Uh, just very quickly, there's also some specific rules in arbitration that you don't see for judges in terms of ethical rules. And one is special rules for party-appointed, non-neutral arbitrators. And, and what is that? In both labor arbitration, but especially international arbitration, often there's tripartite arbitration. There are three arbitrators. I choose an arbitrator, you choose an arbitrator, and those two arbitrators choose a neutral third arbitrator. And so the question is, what about these party-appointed arbitrators? Are they held to the same ethical duty of neutrality uh, that the neutral arbitrator is? And the general answer is no. Uh, these are party-appointed arbitrators. They're supposed to be biased. They're supposed to represent your position. But there are some rules about when they could communicate with the neutral arbitrator. Generally, they have to only communicate with the neutral arbitrator when the other arbitrator is around. They can't have secret private conversations. Uh, and there's also a duty of good faith. A, a, a party-appointed arbitrator cannot try to sabotage the arbitration proceedings. They have to let them go forward uh, normally. Uh, there's generally not so strong enforcement of these rules, but if there are serious breaches, if I don't disclose the conflict of interest, <coughs> later on it might invalidate the arbitration award under the international standards or national standards. Uh, very quickly, what are some of the problems that I've seen or I've looked at in, in structurally with arbitrator ethics? And the first thing is called the repeat player problem. 
Um, what is the repeat player problem? Well, I mean, we could just imagine a hypothetical here. If I'm Apple Computer, right, and I have an arbitration agreement with, you know, a small Lithuanian software company, international arbitration agreement, I have 10 employees, Apple has a lot more value and, and, and a lot more money. We have this arbitration agreement. Think of yourself as an arbitrator. Without knowing anything else about the case, who would you be more likely to rule in favor of in terms of thinking about your own personal interests for future business? Is, is the Masonis <laughs> software company in Vilnius, is, are you going to get more business from that entity or Apple in the future? And I think that's like a structural problem in private arbitration that you don't see in the public court system. Uh, and even talking to some of my very good colleagues who do labor arbitration, uh, they admit that that is there, that's present. And where I guess it goes from an ethical issue to a moral issue is sometimes you can imagine, especially the judges among you, there are some cases that are 50-50, could go either way. Uh, and no one's going to doubt you <laughs> Uh, which way you choose. And in those types of cases, it's particularly easy for an arbitrator to say, you know, I probably will get a lot more business from the bigger party, so the decision will go that way. It's called the repeat player in terms of, as an arbitrator, I'm looking for more repeat business in the future. Um, that's a structural problem. Uh, related to that, I have up here is favoritism or signaling outcome through which attorney handles the case. I have a friend and colleague who's a Ukrainian attorney doing international arbitration in Stockholm. He's a young guy, very talented, uh, but when he went to international arbitration against a Spanish company with a team of, you know, a, a very big law firm, uh, well-established arbitration attorneys, they told him at the beginning, you're going to lose the case because of who you are. The arbitrator will recognize you're a young guy and this is not an important case to your client. If it was important, <coughs> you would have chosen a very big law firm with international reputation. It's related to re repeat player, too, because as you can imagine, attorneys have a role in arbitrator selection. So again, arbitrators may have a sense, I don't want to annoy the bigger law firm, because where could I get more business? Possibly through the larger law firm. So it's a, it's a structural problem, uh, I, I think. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip some of these other issues and, and quickly go to mediators and again talk about some ethical and moral issues. Uh, we could repeat the same question with arbitrators. Do they need any kind of ethical regulation at all? If you want to do private mediation, the market should correct that. If you have unethical mediators, people will not choose them, they will not pay them, and that will sort out the problem. However, that has not been the case, and there have been more and more codes of conduct and ethical rules, ABA model rules, ADR service provider rules, also European code of conduct for mediators. Um, it's, it's advisory, but it has been adopted by many countries as binding laws, as a code of ethics for mediators. What are the common themes? Neutrality, impartiality, confidentiality, Again, same as arbitrators, conflicts of interest, disclosure, uh, compensation, we'll talk about that a little bit, and self-determination. Self-determination is the right of a party to decide the outcome of the case. Uh, in other words, one of the advantages, arguably, of mediation is that by going to mediation instead of arbitration or court, I decide what the result of the case is, not some outside third party. The mediator will help this process, but the mediator will not make a decision. What are some issues that, ha that I've seen in my practice and also in my research? Uh, one is, is there uh, a dichotomy? Is there uh, a conflict between being fair and neutral? Being strictly fair <coughs> and being neutral. And the example that we could come up with, again, is you can imagine in Lithuania or United States or any place, uh, a, a poor villager with no education gets poisoned by a bottle of Coca-Cola that was negligently produced. Uh, the case, you're, you're a lawyer and you're a mediator, you know that the case is worth uh, a million euros, uh, 10 million litas, a million dollars, something like that. 
The company with a, a team of 10 lawyers goes into the mediation process and offers 10,000 euros. You take that back to the, the poor villager and who has no lawyers, and the villager says, I'll take it. That's, that's a great deal. <coughs> well, if, is, if you're a mediator, is that fair? Is that a fair result? If you tell the villager, to tell the poor farmer, well, listen, you know, I, I could tell you as a, as a lawyer, as an experienced lawyer and a mediator, this case is in the million euro range. It's not 10 million. If you do that, are you being neutral? As a mediator, the key issue, right, is neutrality. You have to be balanced between both sides. And so sometimes in looking at some of these ethical codes, there's some, sometimes comments of fairness. And I would suggest sometimes there is a conflict between being fair and being neutral. Um, that's, that's a problem. Um, now, what, what's a possible solution to that? <coughs> some, uh, some mediation experts have suggested the way, and you can think about this yourself, what's a way around that without telling the, the villager that you have a, ten, you have a million dollar case and, and not a $10,000 case? Do you have a lawyer? Uh, have you considered getting a lawyer? Um, wh wh what have you suffered as a result of drinking this poisonous Coca-Cola? Let, let's, let's look at your damages. Let's, let's write them down. There might be some indirect ways to help achieve a fair result. So there are some strategies, I think, that can get around it. But it is a problematic area, I think, for a mediator to be both fair and impartial. Um, quickly, is evaluative mediation inherently biased? Evaluative mediation is a process where we allow the mediator to give his or her judgment about the value of the case. Some jurisdictions uh, prohibit evaluative mediation. Uh, for example, Bulgaria does, and some states in the United States do. Uh, and the idea is that it's inherently not neutral. If I tell you your case is worth nothing, it's terrible, well, that's my opinion. I, I might be wrong. And how do you feel in the process of mediation if the mediator is telling you you have a terrible case? It might feel that you're taking one side over the other. Um, another issue quickly is mandatory mediation in good faith. Italy just switched uh, recently last year, I believe, to <coughs> mandatory mediation. You have to go to mediation. Uh, process. In the United States, some jurisdictions have mandatory mediation plus good faith. What does good faith mean? You have to try. You don't have to get an agreement, but you have to participate. Some ethical issues in mediation uh, that I've experienced in my practice in these situations have been sometimes the mediator could take this good faith requirement too far. Uh, again, the mediator might be pay being paid by the hour. And therefore, well, I tell the mediator, we can't settle the case. We have to go back to court. There's no way. This mediation is a waste of time. Mediator, let's try. Let's, let's keep going. Let's, let's do it another month. Let's do it another two months. So sometimes there's also some ethical issues about how far are you doing it to, to increase your, your own salary, your own benefits, and how far are you doing it just to get a, an agreement. Sometimes confidentiality is uh, also a problematic ethical issue for, for mediators. Uh, generally, what, ha what you tell a mediator, like what you tell an attorney, is strictly confidential. There are some exceptions to that rule, but generally you can't disclose what someone told you in mediation. Um, the couple of examples that I have, just very quickly, uh, one, one employment case, an employer offered a very good settlement to its employee. And they also told, conf told confidentially to the mediator, by the way, we also have some criminal evidence against the employee. After we settle this, we're going to take them, we're going to seek prosecution. And in all likelihood, this person is going to have some jail time. So we're happy. We'll give them the, what they want in the settlement, but we're going to go forward in prosecuting them. You know, as a mediator, now you have this information, and you're going back to the employee who will take this deal. And you know that the hammer is going to drop later on. Uh, sometimes that creates problems. Other, uh, other typical, well, not typical, but unusual examples that create problems. Um, if one party has a medical report that's not in the hands of the other side yet, that shows that they have more serious injuries than they know about, 
Uh, and it, perhaps it's a very early stage of the proceedings, or the court proceedings have not begun, and, and you're in mediation. Again, as a mediator, you could have a, a, a settlement that one side wants, but then you have a medical report that's confidential, and you know the party may have some serious health problems as a result of it. That may fall into some exceptions about disclosure, <coughs> but it creates some, some issues. Finally, I, I promise to talk few, oh, like 30 seconds or a minute about compensation. And uh, there, there is an issue, interestingly, in mediation. Um, some ethical rules say that you cannot take a contingency fee as a mediator. Uh, contingency fee, uh, it's also called a success fee or a settlement fee. You only get paid if you get a settlement as part of the mediation. Um, many jurisdictions feel that's unethical. And, and why? Because now as a mediator, maybe, maybe the parties shouldn't settle. Maybe this should go to the court. But you, now you have a financial reason or incentive to really force a settlement. Why? So you'll get paid. Uh, Interestingly, Argentina has the opposite practice. They encourage that, and they encourage it for reasons of getting cases out of the court and settling it. So in Argentina, it's perfectly fine, and it's normal to have a contingency fee arrangement for a mediator. So uh, th this is a gigantic field, and I'm at the end of the day, so I don't want to wait. I don't want to hold up more of your time, but I just want to at least introduce some ethical and moral issues in arbitration and mediation. So thank you very much for your time.